Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, the E9 is a main road in Scotland stretching from the central belt to the north. It is also one of the most dangerous roads in the country. The SNP promised to fully duel the A9 from Perth to Inverness in their 2007 manifesto, 16 years ago. Campaigners were in Parliament yesterday raising this issue once more. Recently, the Inverness Courier highlighted the Government's broken promise on this issue with a tombstone on their front cover. After a further death last month, the paper followed up with another sombre front page. It read, and this is my question to the First Minister, the Scottish Government has no update on its delayed duelling project, leaving us all to ask how many more people have to die. First Minister. Uh, first and foremost, Presiding Officer, my thoughts are with every single person, uh, family, community that has been affected by the tragic loss of life uh, on uh, the A9. And Douglas Ross, the Inverness Courier, and others who have raised the issue, I know many uh, in my own benches who have raised the issue of the duelling of the A9, are right to look at this issue, of course, uh, through the prism of safety in our roads. It is an issue around safety. And that is why, since 2007, that commitment that Douglas Ross references, we have taken action. There has been £430 million pounds of investment in the A9. Uh, road users are benefiting, of course, from dual sections uh, already. We know Concraig and Dalradi, we know Lancarty and the Pass of Burnham, which opened uh, in September 2017 and August 2021, uh, respectively. Uh, we are, I am, this government is absolutely committed to dueling the A9. In terms of the timetable that is set out, of course, the uh, uh, Jenny Ruth, when she was Transport Minister in February uh, of uh, this year, um, she, of course, uh, rightly uh, gave an update to Parliament in relation uh, to uh, the Section Tomatin to Moy uh, section. And she made it clear that that couldn't go ahead because, of course, our obligations to public finance. And during that update, uh, she indicated that uh, work was ongoing and will conclude in autumn of this year to update on the renewed timescale for completion. But what I would say to Douglas Ross, of course, uh, that doesn't preclude us from taking action in relation to safety and road work improvements in the A9. I can, come into some, I can give some detail uh, of that uh, uh, shortly. But what I would say to Douglas Ross is that it's so important in these uh, infrastructure projects that value for money, of course, uh, is an obligation that we have to adhere to. Uh, and therefore, uh, I would say to Douglas Ross, we will give that update uh, on the other side of the summer recess in autumn 2023. But anybody listening uh, should be uh, absolutely assured that we have a cast iron guarantee to continue the duelling work we've already done and to ensure that we duel the A9 Perth to Inverness. Douglas Ross. That's perhaps one of the most disappointing answers mm -hmm. I've ever heard in this chamber. Last year, deaths on the A9 were at a 20-year high. The First Minister was trying to say the millions of pounds of investment and the upgrades that we have seen uh, are a success. In a decade, the SNP have upgraded 11 miles of that route, just over a mile a year. And somehow that's a success, while still too many families grieve the loss of a loved one. During his leadership bid, Hamza Yusuf claimed that dueling the A9 would be the first thing I will do in office. But since his election, this is what Laura Hansler, who has been campaigning for improvements on the A9, has said. Hamza Youssef made a lot of promises. So where are these promises? This week, his government tabled a question to announce the latest procurement timetable for the A9. But it was withdrawn at the last minute. We don't believe that has ever happened before in this parliament. So can the First Minister tell us why that announcement was withdrawn. And will he use the opportunity today at First Minister's questions to tell us what his government had planned to announce earlier this week? First Minister. Uh, the, the GIQ uh, was withdrawn. And Douglas Ross, I don't know if he was in the chamber or not this week or, or doing uh, one of his other jobs, but if he was here in this chamber, he would have seen 
that of course we have a new transport team in place. So it is only right, of course, that I have asked that transport team to look at the detail uh, of the duelling of uh, the A9. It is also uh, incredibly important for government in particular, uh, of course, that when we do uh, give information to this parliamentary chamber, that it is the most up-to-date and, of course, the most accurate information that we can provide. And today, of all days, of course, uh, the Conservatives should understand the value of accurate statements made uh, to this Parliament. So I will ask, of course, and have already asked the new transport team uh, to look at the issue of A9 uh, duelling and, of course, update Parliament uh, in due course. In terms of safety, because I always bring it back to that issue of safety, which is so important when it comes to the duelling of the A9, we do have an ongoing programme of road safety improvements. So the fact that uh, we are taking time in relation to the timetable of the A9 uh, this summer doesn't preclude us, doesn't stop us from making those road safety uh, improvements. Uh, for example, uh, in last year we spent approximately £100,000 to improve safety at three sites on the A9. We have also invested uh, almost £400,000 to refurbish the average speed system between Dunblane uh, and Inverness. Uh, since January, as part of £5 million pounds of investment we delivered uh, by 2024-25, uh, we have delivered uh, lining and signing improvements around Dunkeld, additional signs that are being installed at key locations uh, too. And there are a number of other uh, interventions that we have uh, made. Of course, I go back to what I said uh, at the beginning uh, in my response to Douglas Ross's first question, that a single loss of life on our roads uh, is not acceptable. And that's why uh, we have uh, very ambitious targets in relation to reducing uh, casualties uh, and fatalities uh, on our roads. And the longer term trend for road casualties in Scotland has been that downward trend since 2000. The number of people killed on our roads has decreased by 47 per cent. But I want, it to go, I want us to go even further, and that is why, uh, of course, the duelling of the A9 uh, is a priority for this Government, and we will continue to make progress on that priority. Douglas Ross. The First Minister is trying to say the change in the Transport Minister was the reason his Government took, as far as we are aware, an unprecedented step of withdrawing an announcement. The question was lodged at 3.47 p.m. on Monday afternoon. It was just a little over 12 hours later that the new Transport Minister was in place. It was almost a week since the previous Transport Minister had resigned. Something happened from Monday afternoon when Jim Fairley was asked as a backbench SNP to put in this question to get an announcement from the Scottish Government for it then to be withdrawn. The fact that we were going to have a new Transport Minister was known to the First Minister to the Cabinet, to the entire Parliament. Why did it have to be withdrawn? What did the SNP want to tell this Parliament and Scotland about the A9 that it now sounds like the First Minister is not going to tell us until the autumn? These are serious questions that need to be answered. We also heard this week from the Civil Engineering Contractors Association. They said the civil engineering sector in Scotland has known for many years that the promise to dual A9 by 2025 would not be met. They said that the SNP-run Transport Scotland is regarded by civil engineers as, and this is a quote from them, the worst client to work for in the UK. So does the First Minister have full confidence in his agency to dual A9 from Perth to Inverness? And will he tell us what he planned to announce in Parliament this week that now seems to be delayed for months? First Minister. I have, uh, President Officer, already answered the question around the withdrawal of the GIQ, a new transport team in place. They are taking a look again <coughs> at the timetable uh, in relation to the A9 duelling. And of course, as I have said, it's so important that when we are ready uh, to announce this to this Parliament an update on the A9, we will absolutely do that. And we will ensure, of course, what we uh, what uh, update we provide uh, is uh, accurate in terms of a statement made uh, to this Parliament. In terms of the criticisms, and I saw those criticisms from the Civil Engineering Contractors Association, uh, I take those uh, criticisms very, very seriously. And I've asked Transport Scotland, who have already engaged with SICA uh, before, to ensure that they continue to engage uh, with the Civil Engineers uh, and the Engineering Contractors Association uh, to consider, for example, what improvements can be made both to our contract delivery, which is important, but also the procurement mechanisms that we have uh, in place to maximise market interest 
uh, in the new procurement. So I think there was a lot in there from SICA uh, that we can reflect on, and I would expect and have told Transport Scotland uh, that they uh, should uh, reflect on. In terms of uh, Transport Scotland's uh, ability to deliver uh, infrastructure projects, can I just remind Douglas Ross, of course, it is under this SNP government that we have seen the delivery of the Queensferry crossing, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, M8, M73, M74 motorway improvement projects. Yeah and many, many other infrastructure projects, not just on road, uh, but also, for example, in rail as well. So we have a proud track record of investing in capital infrastructure here in Scotland, improving roads, improving rail right across the country, and that's the progress I'll look to ensure that we build upon. Douglas Ross. A proud track record that SNP politicians applaud has seen 11 miles of the A9 jewelled in a decade, despite a decade and a half ago saying it would be fully jewelled. And the First Minister is getting annoyed at having to repeat answers about this withdrawn question. He must have known he was about to appoint a new Transport Minister. I have said it was Monday afternoon his government asked one of his backbenchers to submit a question. So will he pledge now to publish all details between government ministers, Transport Scotland, special advisers on what led to the decision, which I think is unprecedented in this Parliament, to withdraw that government-initiated question. Because the fact is, the SNP have broken their promises to Julie A9 for 16 years, and there is still no end in sight, with devastating consequences for so many families. People from Perthshire to the Highlands are scathing about this government's record. They feel they're being forgotten by SNP politicians at Holyrood. They say failing to get this fixed is a dereliction of duty. Campaigners say they fear that duelling the A9 will now take to 2050. Is it really going to take another 30 years to fulfil a promise made by the SNP more than a decade and a half ago? And I come back to my very first question. How many more people have to die before this road is fully duelled? First Minister. It is, it is not going to take to 2050 to duel the A9. And of course, as I said, we will give an update to Parliament. Uh, as uh, previous Transport Secretaries have said, once that work is done over the course uh, of uh, the summer. I mean, one of the other challenges we have, of course, with capital infrastructure projects uh, is the cost, the increasing cost, because of high inflationary costs, something that the Conservatives, uh, of course, should know well about, given, of course, that they have been the architects of the sky-high inflation that we have seen because of their economic mismanagement of the public finances. And of course, it is the Conservative UK Government that has repeatedly cut our capital budget uh, over the years, why we have to make extremely difficult choices. But even amongst those difficult choices, let me once again reiterate the cast iron guarantee that we have of duelling the A9, building upon the progress we have already made. And Douglas members, Ross and his First party. Minister, First Minister, I have already asked if members could resist any temptation to contribute while members are putting questions or responding to them. First Minister. The issue of, of course, the GIQ. I have already made it clear we have a new transport team in place, and I have asked that new transport team to once again to look at this issue. This is desperate stuff from Douglas Ross, who is trying to dodge, no doubt deflect, of course, from this serious scandal that his party is engulfed with Boris Johnson, with Boris Johnson, not just lying to the House of Commons, but of course betraying the people of this country and of the UK when they, of course, couldn't visit a loved one, when they couldn't attend funerals of a loved one, and they shouldn't be shouting this down, when they couldn't, when they couldn't attend the funeral of a loved one, Boris Johnson was breaking the rules and having parties in number 10. So Douglas Ross can try to deflect, he can try to dodge, but of course nobody in this country will forget that Douglas Ross backed Boris Johnson to the very hilt, presiding officer. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President, sir, earlier today, the government released its new cancer strategy. Cancer remains Scotland's biggest killer and brings anxiety and misery to thousands of people across Scotland every year. Identifying and treating cancer quickly saves lives. But the 62-day treatment standard has not been met in over a decade, 
and today's 10-year strategy has given no indication of when it will be met, and the action plan does not mention it at all. So can I ask the First Minister when the Government expects to meet the 62-day cancer treatment standard? First Minister. Well, of course, the worst challenge is, as Anna Sauer is right to say, even pre-pandemic in relation to the 62-day target. We had, of course, been achieving the 31-day target uh, with uh, consistency. And there are challenges because of the shock of the pandemic, which is, of course, uh, further exacerbated uh, both the 31-day target uh, and the 62-day target. Uh, in relation uh, to the actions uh, we are taking, the cancer strategy uh, is an important, uh, an important plan. It has, of course, been welcomed uh, by, we know, uh, many uh, stakeholders. But what I would say to Anna Sauer, he will understand the scale of the challenge we're facing. We had to take, I think, probably, arguably, the most difficult decision that the government had to make during the course of the pandemic, and that was to pause cancer, cancer screening for a number of months. We are working through that backlog. And what I would say to Anna Sauer, though we're not meeting, uh, as uh, he was right to say, the 62-day target, and challenges still remain, uh, although we are close to the 31-day target, not quite uh, meeting it. Uh, we are seeing more patients uh, in the last quarter uh, than, for example, uh, the quarter uh, uh, before. And we are seeing more, uh, more people uh, through both the 31-day uh, pathway and also the 62-day pathway. But there's a range of actions uh, we are taking because, of course, cancer and the recovery of those waiting times, the recovery of the NHS, is of the highest priority to this government. Anna Sarwar. So the First Minister didn't actually answer the question about when they expect to meet the target. And I remind him, COVID didn't start a decade ago, and that's been uh, the level of time that they haven't met this standard. But of course, we need a strategy. Of course, we need a plan. But we actually need the government to deliver quality cancer care. Uh, Malcolm Graham is 76 and lives on Lewis. Uh, last year, he had a tumour removed, but last month was told the devastating news that his cancer was back in his liver and lungs. He's been waiting anxiously to hear about when his treatment would start, but this week he received this letter. We regret to inform you that currently we do not have an appropriate oncologist able to see you to supervise your ongoing treatment. We are in discussion with the other cancer centres within Scotland, but they also have a shortage of oncologists and as yet have not been able to offer any assistance. This does sadly mean you are likely to experience some delay and disruption to your treatment until we can find a replacement. Delay and disruption. This is life and death for people across the country. There is a shortage of oncologists across Scotland when cancer remains Scotland's biggest killer. After 16 years of SNP government, why is there no oncologist available anywhere in Scotland to treat Mr Graham? First Minister. Uh, I'm, of course, happy to look at the detail of the case. I don't have all the detail uh, of the case, but I'm happy to look at it if Anna Sauer uh, wishes to send uh, those uh, details across. Uh, uh, what I would say is, of course, there is a, a, a global shortage, in fact, we know, uh, of oncologists, and we have been working uh, over the last uh, 16 years to increase the number of oncologists here in Scotland. Since 2007, there's been an almost 100% increase in consultant oncologists from 695 uh, whole term equivalents in September 2006 to 137.2 uh, whole term equivalents uh, in the last statistics in December 2022. Uh, we've increased uh, consultant radiologists by 60 per cent uh, as well. We've uh, increased uh, radi uh, consultant radiologists. Uh, uh, in fact, we have a higher rate of consultant radiologists per head than in other parts uh, of the UK. But, of course, given the case that Anna Sawar has raised, given uh, issues that have been raised around, for example, uh, Tayside Breast Cancer Service, we know that there are still work to do. And that's why we set up, I set up, in fact, as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care Task Force to look at what more we need to do to attract uh, oncologists uh, to our hospitals, to our ser cancer services uh, here in Scotland. So to the individual case that Anna Sawar uh, raises, I am, of course, happy to look into the detail of that, but I want him to be assured that there has been action, will continue to be action, uh, to increase the number of consultant uh, radiologists and indeed consultant oncologists uh, working here in Scotland. Anna Sarwar. I welcome that the First Minister will look at the case and I suggest he does it urgently, but it shouldn't take bringing individual cases to this Parliament for people to get life saving cancer treatment right across the country. There is a shortage of oncologists across Scotland, and we've been raising the NHS workforce crisis for years. And the strategy he published today says the workforce review won't conclude until 2026. People with cancer cannot afford to wait. The crisis is now. The 31-day standard repeatedly missed. 
the 62-day standard not met in over a decade, and staff shortages are putting people's lives at risk. The SNP have been in government for 16 years, and today they've published a 10-year plan. Why does Hamza Yusuf think people across Scotland have to wait 26 years to get adequate cancer care? First Minister. Uh, I don't think that. And, and of course, pre-pandemic, we were consistently meeting uh, the 31-day standard, although we have dipped just below the 95% uh, performance. I think the latest performance was 94.1%. Uh, that means over 9 out of 10 people are, of course, uh, being seen within that 31-day uh, target. And the median waiting time for treatment remains at five days in relation to that particular pathway. So I don't believe that people should have to wait longer. And again, I go back to the point I made in response to Anna Sauer's very first question. That is that we're treating over 35% more people in the 62-day pathway than was the case, for example, 10 years ago. So we are seeing more and more people through these pathways. And of course, we're doing everything we possibly can, and I will continue to do everything we possibly can to ensure that we improve the performance on both the 31-day and the 62-day uh, pathway. We're also looking at how we can uh, redesign our cancer uh, services, what more we can do to add additional uh, capacity. For example, uh, we also have mobile uh, MRI scanners, uh, mobile CT scanners, which again are providing some additional capacity, often to hard to reach remote, rural and island uh, communities. So this government and I am entirely focused on the NHS recovery, but uh, of the highest priority is of recovery of our cancer services. Thank you. Question number three, Stephen Kerr. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the future and viability of rural schools. First Minister. Rural schools play an important part in our communities. Like many uh, Western European countries in particular, Scotland is facing a set of long-term population challenges. And we know this is particularly acute in some remote rural and island communities. That's why in 2021, the Scottish Government published Scotland's first population strategy. In Scotland, there is a presumption against the closure of rural schools where local authorities do plan to close a rural school. They are required to undertake a thorough and lengthy consultation process. This includes demonstrating the educational benefit of the closure, considering the impact of the school closure on the local community and school travel arrangements and consulting the community on alternatives to closure. This process ensures that the impact of any decision is properly considered and options are explored. No school closure decision, of course, is ever and should ever be taken lightly. Stephen Kerr. Well, last weekend, the Herald newspaper revealed that 40 mainly rural schools have been closed or mothballed in recent years. And colleagues across all parties in this parliament have described these numbers as alarming and evidence of the blatant disregard that this SNP government has for the rural and remote areas of Scotland. Families with young children in rural Scotland are being left high and dry by the SNP's neglect. And the SNP government still has no plan for any of this. And now there are 15 more schools at risk of closure, including Blackness School in my constituency. So will the First Minister like his predecessor, turn his back on rural Scotland, or will he take this opportunity to send a strong message of support for our rural schools? First Minister. Well, I simply don't agree at all with Stephen Kerr's characterisation, but let me take the issues uh, in turn. First and foremost, uh, of course, these are decisions for local authorities uh, to take. It is usually the Conservatives who are the first to complain if they perceive or uh, believe that the Scottish Government is in any way interfering in local decision-making. So let's allow and empower our local authorities to make the decisions in consultation with the local communities uh, that they believe uh, are right for them. And of course, it is the SNP that brought in further additional protections for rural schools. These include, these include for example, clearly demonstrating that local authorities has considered alternatives to closure, an assessment of the likely impact, of the community impact uh, on travel to school arrangements for local pupils, for example. Uh, the local authority must set out educational benefits uh, of the closure. If the proposal to close the school is rejected, then the local authority can't repeat that process for another five years. So a whole host of protections that have been brought in by the SNP. And of course, depopulation is a serious issue. That's why we have, again, a range of actions that we are taking to address 
uh, depopulation. In 2021, we published Scotland's first population strategy. Uh, the delivery of the strategy is overseen by a ministerial population task force. But of course, what hasn't helped depopulation in remote rural island communities is a hard Brexit being imposed upon Scotland <laughs> against our very will. That has seen... Thank you. That hard Brexit that has been opposed by Stephen Kerr and his colleagues, of course, has not helped with European migration to Scotland. And if only Scotland had the powers to rejoin the European Union, perhaps we could reverse depopulation for good, Presiding Officer. I call Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Many rural communities are facing complex and long-term population challenges. Schools need pupils in order to be viable, and school roles rely on communities retaining or attracting families into their area. Many rural communities are dealing with a legacy of outmigration and depopulation, much of which predates this establishment of the Scottish Parliament. Can the First Minister set out what benefits the Scottish Government's rural visa pilot proposals could offer to schools in our rural communities? First Minister. Well, it is, I have to say, frankly, quite depressing to listen to the UK Conservative Party and at times, I'm afraid, the UK Labour Party uh, compete in a race to the bottom when it comes to the issue of migration. Let me state unequivocally that migration, immigration to this country, has been good for Scotland. It has been good for years, for decades, uh, to this country, and we welcome migrants to Scotland. Our rural visa pilot proposal, described by the UK Government's own Migration Advisory Committee, was described, and I quote, as sensible and clear in both scale and delivery, deliverability. It would enable rural and remote communities to attract migra migrants in line with their very distinct local needs, include, including, of course, bringing family members with them. This would offer an opportunity to bolster school communities in pilot areas, yeah. and pilot areas would also be enabled to address discrete local public sector workforce needs, for example, around teachers, uh, further supporting communities to flourish. So we do continue to urge the UK government in the strongest possible terms to engage with us uh, and deliver this pilot scheme, or even better, just give us the powers over immigration so we can do it ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Question number four, John Mason. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government plans to mark Clean Air Day. First Minister. We want and have the ambition that Scotland has the cleanest air in Europe. And while there, of course, is always room for improvement, Clean Air Day is an opportunity to highlight the great progress that Scotland is making on improving air quality. For example, for the first time outside of recent lockdown periods, all monitoring sites in Scotland are meeting air quality objectives. This year, Clean Air Day will see a variety of activity taking place, from poster competitions uh, for schools run by SEPA to local authorities uh, running vehicle idling campaigns and businesses engaging with staff on eco-friendly commuting. The Scottish Government is supporting Clean Air Day through funding Environmental Protection Scotland and Global Action Plan to provide the resources to organisations delivering Clean Air Day activity. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the First Minister uh, for that answer. I wonder if he would join me in thanking Healthy Air Scotland Coalition for their work and share my enthusiasm for the LEZ in Glasgow and the help it is giving uh, for people with respiratory problems. Would he help, uh, also congratulate Glasgow City Council on that? But would he share my concerns that the UK government is potentially revoking the European air pollution regulations under the amended retained EU law? First Minister. I do. I would welcome, uh, of course, the work of the coalition. I would also congratulate uh, Glasgow for uh, their work on the LEZ and I can hear Jackie Bailey opposing the LEZ well that was not of course Scottish Labour's position when they voted for uh, the LEZ neither at the local level or indeed a national level but of course we know that the Scottish Labour Party will oppose anything that the SNP exactly. brings forward just for the sake of it. Yeah. Thank you. LEZs are being introduced to improve air quality and support Scotland's wider emission reduction ambitions, as well as to protect Scotland's uh, health. And that is, of course, the point. This is, at its heart, a public health issue. That is why the likes of Asthma and Lung UK Scotland have, of course, supported the introduction of the low emission zones. We're very concerned at the UK government's decision to revoke the UK-wide national air pollution control programme provisions uh, through the retained EU law bill, especially as they appear to have no plan in place to replace these crucial provisions. Scottish Government officials 
do continue to engage with counterparts across the UK to try to resolve this. However, we will not hesitate to act to protect Scotland's devolved interests and the health of the people of Scotland. Liam Kerr. Very grateful. Reducing car travel is key to clean air, yet the Scottish Government cut bus funding by £37 million by ending the Network Support Grant Plus, and recently dismissed my campaign to reopen Cove and Newton Hill stations to slash traffic entering Aberdeen. So when will the Scottish Government actually deliver a route map to the 20% reduction in car kilometres and stop discouraging people from taking public transport? First Minister. Well, of course, that was uh, COVID funding uh, that we gave uh, to the sector, understandably so, understandably so to support them uh, during the course uh, of uh, lockdown and over the course of the pandemic. And it was, of course, the UK government that unilaterally withdrew yeah. COVID funding. I know because I was, of course, the health secretary yeah. here in Scotland at the time when they took that decision to unilaterally withdraw any COVID funding. So we have a good record in relation to helping not just the bus uh, industry, uh, but, of course, investing in public transport. What doesn't help is every time we look to bring forward a measure yeah. that helps to tackle the climate emergency, yeah. it's opposed time and time and time again by the Scottish every Conservatives. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reported concerns that its proposals to ban gas and other direct emission heating systems in new build homes from next year could have a serious adverse impact on the housing sector. First Minister. As though right on cue, uh, the new build, uh, new build heat standard will apply to all new buildings with a warrant from next April. It means that new homes will be fitted with a climate friendly heating system at the outset and so will be future proofed against having to be retrofitted uh, a few years later. The standard is just one part of Scotland's programme to meet our legal climate change targets. Targets which, of course, every single party in this parliament voted for. Yeah. Uh, Lord uh, Dibbon, a former Conservative Secretary of State, in his role as chair of the Climate Change Committee, has highlighted that England will follow the same path a year later and has urged the UK government to meet the same timescales as here in Scotland. There's been extensive consultation, extensive engagement with the industry since 2019 on the proposals and will continue, of course, to constructively work with them to overcome any remaining barriers to delivery. Yeah. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that reply, but, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government's plans for zero carbon heating are shaping up to be another Scottish Green-led mess. Yeah. On new homes, the housing sector are warning fewer homes will be built and prices will rise. On retrofitting, the industry has serious doubts the supply chain can even produce the one million heat pumps the Scottish Government have pledged to install by 2030. And even if it can, there aren't enough people qualified to install them. The construction industry has told me that Scotland needs over 20,000 new engineers and tradespeople by 2028 to have even a hope of meeting that goal. But instead of thousands of new students in training, we have Patrick Harvey crowing about another world-leading target. Presenting officer, big targets aren't a substitute for detailed plans, yeah. and it's obvious to everyone but the First Minister, his Green Minister's contribution to net zero are mostly hot air. So can I ask the First Minister, what's more important to the SNP, a Green Scotland or the Scottish Greens? First Minister. What's most important to the Scottish Government is making sure we have a sustainable planet exactly. to hand on to our future generations to come. Let me, let me respond to Brian Whittle in terms of the response from uh, the industry. He is wrong to categorise categori it as universal uh, opposition. That is not the case. Let's see some of the reaction uh, from uh, some of those uh, in the house building industry. The Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, and I quote directly, uh, SFHA is supportive of the need to improve the energy performance of new buildings and minimise the negative environmental impacts associated with heating our homes. Uh, our members already build high quality homes which exceed the minimum standard of the building regulations. We are therefore supportive of plans to regulate all tenures through changes to building standards. Let's look at what Barrett Developments PLC have to say. Barrett Developments PLC supports the Scottish Government's efforts to meet its statutory climate change targets in the new buildings that should be sustainable and fit for the future. Tullock Homes uh, say from our direction within the Springfield Group, we have already embraced the shift away from direct emission heating systems and have been delivering ASHP and other associated technologies within the group 
across the country for over 15 years. We are supportive of the Scottish Government's principal intentions on new build uh, heat standards and the net zero heating pathway. The trouble, of course, for the Scottish Conservatives is they think that when it comes to the climate emergency, we can just wish it away. Yeah. They voted, quite rightly so, for those ambitious world-leading targets, and then they oppose every yeah, single amazing. action that we bring forward to do something about it. Thank you. The Tories oppose measures to reduce city centre traffic. The U-turn on glass recycling. They now oppose new heating standards. So the Scottish Conservatives should get off the fringes. They should join the consensus in this Parliament, in this country, and take serious action that is required to yeah. tackle the climate emergency in this country. Yeah. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Would the First Minister agree that the many benefits of the new build heat standard will only be fully realised when the UK Government does what it has been promising to do for many years now and rebalances fuel prices to stop electric heating, which is over three times the price of gas, from being penalised? First Minister. Well, Coffey is absolutely right. I believe that the new build heat standards will deliver a range of benefits uh, as it stands. However, I agree on the importance of this particular issue. We have been urging the UK Government for some time to deliver on its commitment to publish proposals to rebalance fuel prices, uh, and which would make the running costs of zero emission heating systems lower than those of gas boilers. But I am afraid time and time again, when it comes to serious action, when it comes to bold action, when it comes to radical action, all we see from the UK Government, I am afraid, is inaction. Yeah, Willie Rennie. There are several housing estates in my constituency in North East Fife in recent years that have had gas boilers installed in them, which I think is idiotic, especially when we are trying to deal with uh, climate change. But can the First Minister agree that to send his minister to discuss with the sector their concerns about the installation uh, of gas boilers? Because I think it is important that we use new technologies like air source heat pumps to try and deal with the big challenge that we face. It might be hard but we need to get on with it. First Minister. Well, I'm absolutely happy to, to engage. And he's right, it will be hard. The action that we have to take in tackling the climate emergency is not easy. Uh, and that's why you can take the path that the Conservatives choose to take, which is not taking that tough action, or we can take the action that I think is supported by, certainly, uh, Willie Rennie, I know, and, and, and the mainstream, and indeed uh, most of this Parliament, which is taking that tough uh, action. And there are, can, there are real challenges in relation to the ambitious targets we have uh, in relation to, to, to climate-friendly uh, heating uh, systems. And one of those issues, for example, is the skills that are needed to install uh, those heating systems is, of course, the supply chain that is required. So these are uh, very serious issues uh, that are well raised by Willie Rennie. We'll engage uh, with him, with the sector, as we, as we have already done, uh, to ensure that we overcome these challenges together. Question number six, Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I declare an interest as a member of the SSPC and convener of the Cross Party Group on Animal Welfare to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that Scotland's leading animal welfare charity, the Scottish SPCA, is in financial crisis. First Minister. The Scottish Government takes uh, very seriously the issue of animal, animal welfare, and I thank Christine Graham for drawing this important matter to my attention, to Parliament's attention. I think anybody would recognise that Christine Graham has had a long-standing uh, record uh, in raising issues around animal welfare for many, many years uh, in this Parliament and indeed out with this Parliament. Um, sadly, I'm afraid to say the, the often callous approach uh, by the Conservative uh, Government, which is failing to help people, failing to help communities, failing to help charities to cope with unacceptably high inflation levels, is all too pervasive. Uh, charities like the Scottish SPCA, uh, which are in the front line of the impact of the cost of living crisis, are no exception. So I do share Christine Graham's concerns. I've asked officials to liaise with the Scottish SPCA to provide support and to fully understand the issues it faces. Yeah. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the First Minister for his answer. Companion animals in particular play a huge role in helping people's mental well-being, but inflation, as the First Minister has referenced, has put huge pressures on the cost of providing them and heartbreak for those who find they simply have not the resources to keep them. This puts more pressure on the SSPC and other animal welfare charities. At the same time, these charities have themselves to cope with inflation. For the SSPCA, for example, it costs 56,000 a day to run, 14% up on last year. 
Will the First Minister, following these uh, discussions that his officials are having with these charities, uh, report back and let us see where these discussions have gone? First Minister. I just heard uh, while I was giving my uh, response to Christine Graham's uh, initial question, the Conservatives mumbling, what has this got to do with the UK government? If they haven't figured out what the cost of living crisis yeah. has got to do with the Conservative government, I suspect when it comes to the next general election, they will find out in pretty brutal fashion. Uh, uh, officer. Thank you. Nobody, nobody uh, should have to give up a loved family pet. Keeping pets uh, and people together is the best way to protect animal and human welfare. So I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight the work delivered by the Scottish SPCA's Pet Aid Scheme. Uh, this initiative aims to support people and pets who are struggling by providing essential food supplies for animals through a network of food banks right across uh, most of Scotland. Officials do hold regular meetings with the Scottish SPCA to discuss current issues and provide support where appropriate through policy advice, through sharing of wider communications, uh, and I will, of course, update Christine Graham uh, on the discussions, the latest discussions I've asked officials uh, to have. And finally, I would urge anyone struggling to care for their pet to call the animal helpline in strictest confidence because there is help, there is advice and there is support available. Thank you. Move to general and constituency supplementaries. I call Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, yesterday was World Blood Donor Day and I'm delighted to be hosting the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service in Parliament immediately after FMQs. So I'd like to ask the First Minister if he shares my view about this immense NHS service, thanks all of those who give blood to save lives and would encourage others to consider doing so. First Minister. I do uh, absolutely uh, agree with Russell Finlay. Uh, on that, I'll come down to the protocol and uh, try to do my bit to raise awareness of World Blood uh, Donor Day. And of course, this government has a really proud track record on extending and increasing the eligibility yeah. of those who can uh, give blood, something I'm very personally yeah. uh, proud of and we should all be proud of uh, as a parliament, as a country, and anything we can do collectively uh, to raise awareness and promote awareness I think is exceptionally important and many of us, uh, most of us I suspect in this parliament have given blood at some point or another. I think it's a good opportunity to, to remind ourselves uh, that we should continue uh, that very good habit indeed. Paul Sweeney. The First Minister is aware that I have been contacted as he will have been as well by constituents and firefighters in Glasgow regarding the proposed cuts by the fire service to uh, facilities in the city and provision. As well as the withdrawal of three fire engines, it is proposed that Pole station's dedicated rescue, bo rescue boat crew, which covers the River Clyde, will be removed and 15 positions will be lost from the station. So rather than having dedicated 24-hour rescue boat crew cover for the River Clyde, there will only be one crew at Pole Medee to cover both the fire engine and rescue boat simultaneously. 22 river rescues were carried out by the dedicated boat crew last year alone. Next week is Drowning Prevention Week, so in that spirit, will the First Minister commit to keeping the dedicated, life-saving Clyde rescue boat? First Minister. I'm, of course, uh, happy to look at the issue that Paul Sweeney raises in uh, more detail. Of course, many of the matters he does raise uh, are operational uh, matters, but of course, I'm happy to look uh, at uh, the issues raised by uh, Paul Sweeney when it comes to the Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, Service. We've continued our commitment to support SFRS uh, delivery and reform with a further uplift of £10 million in resource uh, this financial year 23-24. Uh, in recognition of the pay and indeed the inflationary pressures I've already referenced, uh, we have provided SFRS with additional budget cover of up to £4.4 million on top of the allocation. Uh, we do remain supportive of reform of our public services, and that includes the Scottish Fire uh, and Rescue Service. In common with all public bodies in Scotland, uh, it is right that SFR, SFRS uh, does continue to review its operations, ensure that what it's doing is effective, delivering value for money. And of course, SFRS would of course ensure that they're doing that in collaboration, in conjunction with communities. And of course, uh, safety is of the highest priority uh, to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Notwithstanding uh, all that I've said, I will look at this issue again in further details. Paul Sweeney has asked me to do. Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. It is estimated that 90,000 fewer children will live in relative and absolute poverty this year as a result of Scottish Government policies. This is a significant achievement given the Scottish Government has limited powers and a fixed budget. 
First Minister, what further actions could the Scottish Government take to tackle child poverty if key welfare, tax and employment powers were held in this Parliament? First Minister. Colette Stevenson makes an incredibly important point indeed, and I have mentioned on many occasions in this uh, chamber that uh, the defining mission of the government that I lead will be on reducing poverty and child poverty in particular, building upon uh, the excellent progress that was already made uh, by my predecessor. And that progress report published this week shows our focus on tackling child poverty uh, is making a significant and tangible difference. Um, but as Shirley Ann Somerville uh, said earlier this week, uh, it is like having uh, one hand uh, tied behind our back. There is only so much the Scottish Government uh, can do. We can take all the action we possibly can, and we will, to pull people out of poverty. But we have, uh, frankly, a cruel Conservative government at Westminster uh, overseeing not just a hard Brexit, not just mishandling our economy, but regressive welfare cuts yeah. Yeah. over years and years and years that have plunged people into poverty. If I just take one example, the Tories reversed the welfare reforms that they have already imposed since 2015. They would lift an estimated 70,000 people yeah. out of poverty, 30,000 children out of poverty. So there's no doubt our ambition to tackle child poverty, they are restricted, which is why, of course, we continue to argue for the full powers to tackle inequality to be in our hands as opposed to in the hands of a Conservative Westminster government. Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, can the First Minister update the Chamber on the Scottish Government actions to campaign for the approval of emergency use of Azulox for bracken control in Scotland? And will he commit to reversing the appalling decision to remove support for bracken control through the Agri-Environment Scheme, which, if reinstated, will improve biodiversity, it will protect heather for pollination, and it will protect walkers and workers against Lyme disease, which the ticks carry? First Minister. As I have said uh, previously, we are willing to look at the issue, but we are following, of course, the agreed process, the process that has been followed for many, many years. And we have, of course, as a Scottish Government, provided a submission to the Health and Safety Executive. I think we're waiting for other governments across the UK yeah. to do so similar. And, uh, of course, I will look at this issue because it is an important issue that has been raised by many members right across the parliamentary chamber. We do know about the potential risk of uncontrolled bracken. And if there is an update from the Health and Safety Executive, uh, I will ensure that this Parliament is informed expeditiously. Yes. Julian Mackay. A, I lodged the final proposal for my Safe Access Zones Bill, and I want to thank campaigners, those who contributed to the consultation, and MSPs across the Chamber for their support. Could I invite the First Minister to take this opportunity to reaffirm his support for the Bill and encourage others to sign the final proposal this afternoon? to show that this Parliament will not just stand up for reproductive rights, but will advance them and strengthen them. First Minister. Thank you. I, I agree with uh, every single word of Gillian Mackay's uh, question, and I am very happy to reaffirm my support. Uh, women should be able to access abortions without judgment. It is simply not acceptable for anyone to experience harassment, intimidation, or unwanted influences they access what is essential health care. Uh, I would not have been the only one uh, that was moved from uh, the... the uh, it was a video made by one of the doctors, Dr Greg uh, Irwin, uh, at the Glasgow facility when he was talking about uh, our own mothers, our own sisters, our own nieces accessing health care, trying to access health care in the face of that intimidation. So I'm delighted to see that Gillian Mackay has published the consultation analysis and the final bill proposal on safe access zones. This represents the next stage in bringing forward this essential legislation. Uh, I congratulate her for the amount of work that she has put in to get to this point, and she can be absolutely assured of the Scottish Government's commitment to giving her our full support, and I urge members across the Chamber to back her proposals. And Foyle Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in February this year, the Minister for Victims and Community Safety confirmed that the car wash sector was high risk for labour exploitation. Uh, the Minister also confirmed that 39 premises were attended by police across the country and a number of offences were detected and persons safeguarded. In light of this, can the First Minister advise whether the Scottish Government would consider implementing a licensing scheme for a car wash in Scotland to ensure uh, practices such as human trafficking and modern slavery uh, 
are prevented in this trade. First Minister. Uh, can, I say, can I thank uh, Faisal Chaudhry for um, raising what is an incredibly important issue, I know, and an issue that, he, that is very close uh, to his heart and that he has raised uh, on a number of occasions uh, publicly to this government. And I'm pleased to say uh, the vast majority of this parliament, I know, uh, shares our ambition uh, to eradicate, all this parliament, to eradicate uh, human uh, trafficking. And we will work uh, right across uh, the UK with other governments uh, where necessary with some of those powers uh, are uh, reserved to do what we can, as I say, to eradicate uh, human trafficking. On the very specific issue uh, that Faisal Chaudhry asked me in relation to looking at a licensing scheme, I'll take the issue that he raises away. Uh, I will give it uh, the due consideration uh, he asked me to do, uh, and I will make sure the appropriate minister writes back to him in due course. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Emma Harper, and there will be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so. Thank you. Could I please ask those uh, visitors in the public gallery who are leaving the chamber to please do so uh, quickly and quietly because in fact we are now going to resume our business. Thank you very much indeed. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 8765 in the name of Emma Harper on World Asthma Day 2nd May 2023. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Emma Harper to open the debate around seven minutes please Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to lead this vitally important debate to recognise that World Asthma Day took place on the 2nd of May 2023 and it had a theme this year of asthma care for all. I thank members from across the chamber, all parties in fact, who supported my motion allowing the debate to go ahead. And I also thank Asthma and Lung UK Scotland for its policy office and its policy officer, Gareth Brown, for the briefing and for all they do to support those with asthma and their families are included in that as well. In particular, as co-convener of the Lung Health Cross Party Group with my colleague Alexander Stewart, MSP, I also thank all involved in the Cross Party Group. We have carried out a lot of work relating to asthma in the past and the input from clinicians, asthma support groups and those living with asthma like Asthma and Lung UK Ambassador Olivia Fulton is absolutely invaluable. It is worth noting that Olivia, who thought she could never participate in sport because she has quite severe asthma, she is now playing wheelchair rugby and she is absolutely loving it. President Officer, as my motion indicates, World Asthma Day is organised by the Global Initiative for Asthma.